and hey good morning good evening and good afternoon and wherever you are in this wide wonderful beautiful world you're very welcome my name's jason cooper i'm a sales relationship coach um i help people achieve better results by using their mind and using their brain and helping people deliver better results so this episode is called the mindful leadership um it's all about gifted leaders that employ brilliant and unusual strategies to great effect and this series is insightful leaders and today no other than chris miguel you're very very welcome to this podcast uh, Jason, good morning. Thank you for for uh, so, having me on. I'm really looking forward to this. Like we spoke last week on a live event, and I got you back in, and we're doing the podcast. Uh, and it's going to be slightly different from the last time. If you don't mind, look, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, um, background about Chris. So Chris, um, he's from Northern Ireland. He's, uh, is it Down Patrick that you're from or in and around that area? No, no, no. That's the uh, east in, in the centre in Tyrone in Omer. Tyrone. I do apologise. I don't know why I had Down Patrick in my but You know, it's uh, not that far away. So, no, no. so live a life of fight or flight and always choose to fight. And I always had that winning mindset that he mm. set his goals and he set his dreams. And he's had a remarkable journey from when he uh, was left to look after a pub and serve his guests and his clients, he actually um, was one of these guys that would be in the background and going, well, I know so much about the bookies. I know so much about this. He'd always have his uh, clients and his uh, guests come up to him and ask him all these wonderful questions. And like, he'd always be like a bookie runner. So we learned at a, uh, a really young age to bring his... Um, people skills to the next level and i think at a young age you can develop that speaking to adults because then you speak in adult voice as a from a child i think that's wonderful mm -hmm. so you did that and uh from the family pub uh to mega states gambling which is working in the city city of london which is the square mile where it's just the financial district for all the people outside of uh, the UK and uh, outside of um, everywhere else that don't really know what uh, the financial district. So he's led a sort of an up and down life, really. So <laughs> always come from sort of um, areas of emotional conflict. Um, and then he left his uh, career at Merrill Lynch and sort of almost went into burnout to actually reinventing himself into his later career as the million dollar Irishman. So Chris, you're very welcome. Hopefully I've uh, given you some wonderful things here, but could you describe to me um, a little bit about your life today and how you arrived or survived at this point? There we go. That's the million dollar Irishman. Thank you so much. Um, this book has given me a whole new lease of life, you know. I've, I've been doing, as, as we discussed before the call, um, audiobooks, and and I've been expanding my brain. And, and here I am at 58 years old, and I feel uh, intellectually more active than I've done in probably for 25 years. So it's really great to be here today. And and picking up on a couple of the points you made just now, um, I think maybe three for for the sake of this. Number one was. Um, in the pub when I was literally 12, 13 years old, I had to do a shift at the pub from four to six every day. And there'd be so much money in the till when I started, and there'd be so much money in the till when I finished. There'd be so many customers in the bar when I started and so many customers when I finished. Now, these customers were very often the parents of people I went to school with. And I'd be talking to them, but would never, never mention the kids or anything like that. It would all be about horses or football or movies, things that I had to learn about. And, you know, I used to read back cut in front to back newspapers and watch as much news as I could in the pub, you know, and stuff like that. So I had an emotional intelligence massively beyond my years is the message on that. Um, so I could sell anything, you know, I did. And, and the challenge was to retain the customers in the, in the bar, you know. Uh, when I was even younger, I was selling raffle tickets uh, when I was sort of eight, nine, ten years old in the pub. My mother, under my mother's supervision, 
uh, and she was dead by the time I was 12. So um, um, we were orphaned at that point. Um, so we had elder siblings and the whole family held together in this dreadful pub business for many years during the worst of the war in Ireland, you know, in, in, in the mid 1970s. So anyway, um, what happened then is, um, you know, at, at, as a younger age, I would sell raffle tickets and people would say things like, oh, Chris, you could sell snow to the Eskimos and sand to the Arabs. So I've always had a sense of being able to sell and make it happen. So Nick, Nick, what happened next is in mid 1970s, uh, a chap called Barney Curley, who just died uh, and on Sunday, in fact, was, was who became my hero in life. This guy was a major gambler and, and um, pulled off a massive betting coup in June 1975, which was three months after our mother died. So um, I wanted to be Barney Curley all my life. I wanted to be gambling. This was a, an ambition of mine. Um, so what happened next is that um, the Christian brothers um, kicked my brother out of school. He was just turned 14 in June 1975, and I left too. So what happened then, we had a sort of period of being out of education and, and you know filling our time in the pub and in my case in the bookie shop. So throughout my teenage years, I was you know uh, learning how to gamble, you know, and patience and winning. You know, these things were all about winning because I I didn't have a pot of money to lose, so I had to learn to win. So from a very early age, I had an idea about money. I wanted to bet and win, and you know, and, and that was my ambition. So what happened next? Um, you know, he, I, I wanted to be Barney Curley. I went through into poker. I went into the stock market. And um, I bummed around for years, you know, after having been a very high achieving grammar school kid to zero. Um, I then went back to school aged 18. Uh, as for my brother, you know, my life was gambling. His was booze. So he went into his first alcoholic treatment center at 18. Um, and, and basically, uh, while, while I went back to formal education at Oma Tech, in later years, he sobered up and went to um, to the Open University and got a got a, 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 a physics degree, chemistry degree, and became a chemistry teacher uh, in Scotland um, at, in Dalkeith outside Edinburgh. So he he did a great job in terms of making that recovery too. For me, I went through Queen's University, I went through into Deloitte, I went through into Ulster Investment Bank. And why I got the job with Ulster Investment Bank is that I told them, you know, I was trading stocks and shares. It was 1987. And the guy at the interview said, you're doing what? You know, this was unheard of. You know, it was like, you're doing what? You know, well, I'm buying all the IPOs and I'm selling them quickly. And it's called yeah. stagging. He said, I know what it's called. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I had all my mates buying shares on my behalf and so on and so on. It was a lot of, lot of fun. So I then moved into um, the investment world. And, and for me, it was not greatly different from the life I'd been living to date. Mm -hmm. So the period at Deloitte and at Queens, I'd, I'd been doing economics and, and accountancy. And, you know, so I, I'm a very good numbers guy. Back in the pub in the day, I used to mark the dartboard, you know, taking, yeah. taking all three darts and the scores off 301 or 501. And, you know, I've got a very, very fast brain, you know, in that respect. So this was all quite easy to me, you know, um, doing this job of making decisions about what we're going to invest and what we're not going to invest in. So a lot of it was common sense. So EQ and IQ again. Um, so what happened then is I nearly died in a car crash um, one year into that job. And um, I'd already made huge progress. I was head of research, you know, I was, I was someone they were putting a lot of faith in. Um, and then it took a year out of my life. So I had to reinvent again and come back. Um, and after that, I went to a court case and after that, I went to London. So I ended up at Merrill Lynch and all my dreams came true. So I, I started off in Merrill Lynch in the firm that they acquired called Smith New Court. The revenues of the firm in Ireland were £45,000. So I took them to one and a half million. So a 30, 30 factor increase in, in four years between 91 and 95. And then um, I took them to $28 million. And, and to give you some sense of $28 million of, of commissions, you know, you're, you're paid a fifth of 1%. That, that equates to, in turnover terms, $14 billion per annum. So I was right at the top of my tree. I was the biggest single revenue generator in London um, for, for Merrill Lynch. And therefore, if not the biggest, then one of the two or three biggest in, in the whole of the city and therefore Europe. So, mm -hmm. but, but what had happened here is that 
fight or flight, you know, I'd, I'd gone all the way, you know, without any plan at all, you know, it's just simply using my, my uh, instincts and street sense and street fighting, you know, I was along the way a county champion boxer, you know, twice I was Tyrone Camp county champion boxer. So I, I used the boxing, as I said in my book, to, um, to basically keep me sane and sober. You know, and um, so so over the years, you know, I, I went through a system of fighting my way to the top. So when I got to the top, I was somewhat friendless, you know, and um, and people envied me, dare I say, were jealous of me. And, and I also didn't fit, you know, I'm a guy five foot six, you know, the city's full of big, tall men with a full head of their own hair, as yeah. they say. And it's also full of Oxbridge types and Eton types. And, yeah. and I wasn't. So so I, I found myself quite friendless and... and um, I burned out, you know, I got to the top of my mountain. I was about to have my first ever down year in 2002. So rather than stay around, you know, I'd become a managing director. I was country manager for Ireland. I was being paid a million dollars a year. I was having my first down year and I thought, you know what? I've got to the top of my mountain and I had what I called my George Best moment and walked out in a million dollar a year job. So uh, it's a hell of a journey. Um, it's only now, um, 20 years later, that I'm actually realizing that I had burned out. So yeah. it's a combination of, you know, I, I had many traumas in my life. We'll come back to that, you know, uh, um, probably four major PTSD events. Um, so Chris, can I ask you a question, actually? Because uh, I want to make sure, it, this is all about mindful leadership, but mm -hmm. we want to make sure of um, how can leaders and leadership people at the moment, especially people in the mind or mindful leadership, is how can we learn from these areas of great heights. And we all have these moments where we get really, really good at what we do and we love what we do. And we all think back to our uh, younger days and we're flying off and we're doing uh, extremely well. But it's um, like a lot of the most successful people out there, they reach the goal and then they go, oh, well, what else is there? There's got to be something else after that. And then they lose and sort of, uh, Steve Jobs, as an example, he reached the heights of his career, but when on his deathbed, he's going, well, that's not really all of that, really, is it? Like, what else should I have done? How can we deal with adversity and how can we learn from it? Because we want to make sure the audience give golden nuggets so they can resonate with them, especially now in these sort of unstable, uncertain times globally. But how can we learn from what you've done? But how can you feed forward and give some uh, some wonderful, smart advice forward. Okay, well, the answers are, are very clear to me. Um, I was I was a lone ranger, you know, a one-man band. They'd gone all the way to the top without any help or any plan, for that matter. But I was also hostile and aggressive. You know, to, to trade in these sorts of numbers, you, you have to make huge calls. You know, we're going to buy this today, we're going to sell this today, and there's a huge emotional intelligence or empathy involved. You've got to make people basically do things they wouldn't otherwise do. You know, you're trading in 10 million pound chips. Um, so so uh, that, that made me very much an isolationist. So I find myself without any really friends network or even, and, 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 and basically I'd always operate direct to the bosses. And then more and more the bosses started to retire and, and left the firm and I, and I find myself quite friendless. So the message is to answer your question, you really have to work within a team, you know, um, and you must also do something very simple, which is ask some questions and not always know the answers. You're, you think you know the answers, but in fact, you need to talk to people. So I, I was really, really uh, alone at the top of my mountain and, and felt that, um, that, I, that, that I, you know, I was going to make a decision and I'd always made money. and I'd always been successful and damn them all, you know, sort of thing. Um, so instead of saying, well, you know what, I'm having a down year, but I had 11 up years, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's actually quite a good result, you know, and, and the markets are crashing, you know, which is why I'm having a down year. And, and when they go better next year, I'll, have a, I'll go right back up again. So yeah. because I've become so isolation, uh, isolationist, um, uh, friendless, effectively, um, the firm was remarkably quite happy for me to, to walk out and go even though it cost them literally 10 million dollars in revenues you know it's a completely yeah. barmy decision to make so the answer is always be part of some sort of structure don't be a one-man band be prepared to talk to people ask questions and get the answers and be prepared to listen that's wonderful and it's good that you've uh, 
sort of maybe realize that after writing your book, like because you reflect and you mm. understand and you, probably at the time you didn't realize uh, where you was and needing that little bit of help and assistance. So all those lone rangers that are out there right now, and there's a lot of people yeah. actually working for big corporates or, or uh, working on their own like you are now, what sort of uh, other single-minded advice can you give to sort of communicate a little bit more effectively with uh, whether you're on a high-flying job or whether you're doing what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What sort of things can you give as a sort of feed forward again? Well, I used to describe myself, you know, bearing in mind that the consistent theme throughout my life has been gambling. So I, I literally regarded the city as an extension of what I've been doing since I was a teenager. Um, and I've had my first bets gambling when I was 12 years old, you know, pre-teenage. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I was, as you said earlier, the bookies runner, carried the bets to the bookies and, and you know, wanted to be a gambler. Um, yeah. So when I, when I got to the city, you know, I was living out my dream effectively. Um, but, um, you know, the answer is you should really, you should really um, have a plan that, that involves other people. You know, I, the point I was about to make was the term I used was, um, I had a term which, I, which was a paraphrase um, something else, which was the lonely life of the long distance gambler. So as a kid, uh, well, I was betting crazy sums of money on a relative basis. Uh, yeah. I couldn't tell anyone because they'd say, oh, you're, you're mad, you're crazy, you know, <laughs> or, you know, they go, oh, you're boasting. One way or another, it was, it was a lose-lose to discuss what you were doing, you know, and if you, if you boasted about something, they'd come back to you the next day and say, oh, did you win today? Which, of course, you didn't. You'd have to admit you didn't, and then you'd be, have a big fall. So I had been very focused on being uh, this isolationist approach all my life. Yeah. So, so the lonely life of the long-distance gambler, you know, I, I should have been probably having therapy over many, many years, um, discussing, you know, the unhappiness that I had, even though I was so successful, I was very unhappy. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I got married in 1998 and, and left the job in 2002. But in the intervening years, you know, um, we flew out to Barbados on Concord. You know, we, we got married in Barbados State at the Sandy Lane Hotel. You know, money was no object. We flew on to Bel Air, Beverly, Beverly Hills, Bel Air Hotel. You know, we stayed in the Oscar Hotel, you know. We, we walked up Stone Canyon Road. We dined in Spago Restaurant with Tony Curtis Absolutely. was there. You know, we had everything. And yet, um, for me at least, you know, I was going further and further into this sort of black hole of what was effectively yeah. depression. But I didn't know it, you know. And as you said earlier, um, I was um, it was only in writing the book that I began to realize all of this. In fact, I don't reflect on these emotions in the book, but it's, it's looking at the book and thinking, how did I get there? What happened? <laughs> what went wrong? You know, is essentially the question. And, and the answer is, you know, I was suffering when I left the city, probably from, certainly from burnout, probably from PTSD, and certainly from depression. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, good to recognize that now, but it's probably taken a little bit more time to actually filter that through until you actually sort of resonated with your mind to actually sort of connect with the, the inner part of your mind to actually verbalize it as you've already done several times. And I think that's awesome. So when people feel stuck and sort of unmotivated or stressed, what do you think they can do now based on what you've done and gone through that um, sort of moments of uh, clarity? Yeah, um, I've probably went through five years there. You know, I, I went back to the city in 2005 and, 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 and then sort of built up a huge property portfolio because I couldn't make the same money anymore. It was out for three years. You know, when, when you play for Man United, as Wayne Rooney knows, the next stop is Derby County. You know, you don't go back to Man United. Um, yeah. so, so I went down the ladder, but I was still making a lot of money, you know, for a million dollars a year to a basic of 100,000 a year, you know, blah, blah. Um, and I was still very, very good at the job, but but I was playing at a lower level, and, you, and you, you just can't, you know, you can't get into those big trades unless you're actually at Merrill Lynch, you know. So anyway, um, I then built up a huge property portfolio, and, and then lost a huge amount of money in the in the in the, in the global financial crisis yeah. in 2008. So I'm getting to the answer, believe me. Um, so what happened next is um, I spent many, many years then unwinding the mess I got myself into in 2008. So what I reflect back um, from, say, 2014 to 2019, I actually can't remember much of anything that I did. 
you know, it feels like I had a whole motivationless life all that time. I can't, I, I can't tell you a positive thing that I had thought about or did over that period. I was still managing, you know, for a decade and more the 2008 problem. And it was quite depressing and, and um, you know, and soul destroying and all those other things. You're, you are achieving unwinding this mess, but it isn't satisfying. So when the first lockdown, when the first lockdown came through, I started finishing um, the, 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 the first version of The Million Dollar Irishman, uh, which was then called The Humpty Dumpty Man, because in that near death car crash, they put me back together again and called me their Humpty Dumpty Man, you know, five surgeons operating on me for five hours. You know, it was like um, Belfast Bomb Factory Hospital, you know, it's sort of an unintended consequences, a consequence of the yeah. troubles. So anyway, um, what I started, I started, I went, I started writing that again in, during the first lockdown and finished it. Um, and then in third lockdown, I went again and, and, and changed it and added a whole lot more about the city um, and added more about my brother's death, um, the brother um, who was 14 and I mentioned earlier on, who was alcoholic. Um, so that was actually quite uplifting. It was difficult, hard, very, very hard. It was a <laughs> crash course in psychoanalysis. Um, um, but but I got it done and and then I started thinking well actually it's great but it could be better because I've rushed the end which was end of destroying my brother's death and, and I hadn't talked a whole lot about my life in the city because I'd sort of felt that I'd failed even though I'd achieved so much so um, I then started writing it and, and made some po funny comments about things I did in the city you know it's like a bit a bit of a wolf of Wall Street sort of type theme to the city element yeah um, because because what I was doing and taking for granted was a crazy world, you know, like people couldn't comprehend yeah. it. So, so to answer your question, um, it's been very, very uplifting writing the book and, and re-engaging my brain. I, I said to you earlier, I've been doing a lot of um, a lot of audiobooks, you know, and I'm just about to start Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey contributed oh, yeah, uh, What Happened good. to You, yeah. And and what happened to you is, is a great question because what happened to me, I don't know. You know, I didn't know until I wrote the book that something actually had happened to me. So Chris, uh, uh, describe to me this actually, like now now you've come out of it and you feel like you're in a good place now, which is wonderful. If you could just step back in time at uh, those moments that you know of, what would you say and describe to yourself or what could you say to yourself back then? Or would, you, would, you, would your younger self even acknowledge or, or completely ignore you? So if you've just met your younger self and you just said hey chris this is the older chris i want to uh give you some advice and help along the way so you can break through this what sort of things could you say to that younger chris because i think it might help the audience as well well i have a 13 year old son and uh he's a super bright kid um, uh, you know he's also a fabulous athlete so he's, he looks like my brother and it's very nice, but I look at him and I think about my brother and myself and the trauma we were going through at that particular time in our lives. Yeah. So, you know, um, the answer is, it, it's virtually impossible for me to have changed my my course, aside from in, in the professional world at Merrill Lynch or in any of those other jobs, because we were orphan kids and basically we, we did what we had to do to survive. It was like a case of survival and winning, you know, it, was, it wasn't any big plan except to have money and, and break away from the really terrible life we were living so whilst i can reflect on my 13 year old and, and give him advice and, and worry about him and think for him and, and steer him and all those things we do uh, there was no opportunity in in my life for that actually um so so where i where i think it could have been changed uh, in a positive way is that that merrill lynch should really have identified that i was having a problem and should really have spent some time and invested some time with me it was it was very very ironic that a number of years after i left the city i'm, I'm going to a an alumni event smith newcourt merrill lynch alumni event on on the at the merrill lynch building in king edward street on the rooftop garden you know it's a e lovely summer's evening and champagne yeah. everywhere and we're, i'm going in and um there's a lady in front of me in the queue and i'm just having a conversation with her and i said so are you part of merrill lynch or ex merrill lynch and she said, I was a consultant for a while. And I said, so what did you do? She said, I would deal with the very high flying um, traders and, and stockbrokers. And, and when they were having a bad year, I would talk to them and say, you know, this, this is what you need to do. You need to think about what you've achieved. And I thought to myself, she probably got that job because of me. 
you know, Chris McGill, you know, George Best, you know, had left yeah. the firm uh, and, and revenues had collapsed and nobody had done anything about it. And someone must have said, you know what, why do we let that guy go? You know, why did, why do we not try and help him? You know, so the answer to the question is I needed help, didn't get it and, and blew up my career and, and you know, and, and the revenue line from Merrill Lynch. It was a lose-lose from all perspectives. So it seems like you've actually found a new path there because helping high flies, helping people that may be in challenging, I know everyone's talking about wellness, everyone's talking about mindfulness and all of that sort of stuff now. But what are the problems that people are facing right now? Can someone like you or people uh, in the same sort of similar situations go back in and say, well, these are the lessons that have been learned by myself but here's a way of, here's a strategy, here's something else that you can do to change the way that you think, or uh, if it's the corporate structure. So what I'm saying to you, there, there's something there, but uh, to articulate it back to you, you, but it might help you, but also might help them and other people like that. What I, what I signed up for the... Um... Uh, what happened to your um, audiobook last night? I listened to a four minute audio clip. So, on my own Million Dollar Irishman homepage, um, there's a four minute audio clip of, of me having flashbacks to my near death experience, which is a really good thing to listen to on, on homepage of Million Dollar Irishman.com. But Invictus, I am the master of my dreams, I am the captain of my soul. It was read by. Um, Oprah Winfrey, sorry, on, on the, as I listened to it on the audio clip last night. So she described a life of being sort of told to sit in the corner and be quiet, you know, being, being, being whipped for speaking up. And, and it was a really striking piece of uh, writing, actually, and very interesting in itself. So I think that people um, get trapped in a corner. You know, she overcame that. She, she, she rose above that despite that. Uh, I think in the world today, um, lots of people are basically depressed, uh, and yeah. I think and I think the way to overcome it, if there is a way, and what I've learned, um, is to actually decide you're going to engage your brain. You know, do social media, for example. I mean, there's pluses and minuses of social media. You know, um, as an ex colleague of mine, Bob Wigley, is a super smart guy, um, has written an excellent book about you know the impact on, on the on the on the um, Generation Z of of um, of um, digital, born digital, it's called. It's a yeah. great book. So anyway, um, join social media, engage with people. You know, whether it's Facebook or anything else. In my opinion, secondly, engage the brain. So, so I have actually got a more active brain today. It's fifty-eight than than I've had for probably twenty-five years, and that's all to do with audiobooks. So I've been um, educating myself, and, and speaking of which, there's a great book called Educated Tara Westover, which is fabulous. You know, I've, I've read a book, Shuggy Bain, which won the Booker Prize. It's a huge tome. I would never have read it but for audiobook. But in that, it, it's distressing and terrible, but at the same time, brilliantly written. So I've actually forced myself through this sort of psychotherapy, as I mentioned earlier, and it's done me the world of good. So I say to people, you know, read, listen. Ideally, you listen. It's great. Go for a walk, do 10,000 steps, and listen to a book. Um, engage your brain and find that there is actually a better place to be. The problem with uh, depression is it is a, a black hole. You know, as you start to slip and you don't engage and you don't talk, um, you just get worse, things get worse. And you can self-help is my message. I have done it. Yep, and uh, we, we've all, I, I've done a little bit of that myself, but I find that uh, audio books, uh, reading and speaking to people is the biggest self-help, but also, having that internal dialogue with yourself and making sure that you speak positively to yourself because the brain is designed to fight or flight uh, in the olden days, but we fight and flight with ourselves now and um, it's mainly negative. So if we can view that and recognize that so we can capture the thoughts so we can just reframe it very slightly. The last, uh, the last question I want to ask you before we wrap up today is, how do you view success now? Uh, you probably answered a lot of that already, but how do you view success now as opposed to back then? Uh, picking up on the fight or flight thing as well, you know, my whole life was fight, not flight. Um, and, and then I did do my flight thing, which was 2002, 20 years ago, more or less. 
And so um, I think I think I have used success today. It's it's more about nurturing my family really, and I've, I've still got four kids, age thirteen to twenty years old, and all of them need help. So I'm there as dad. You know, it's a whole different thing. I didn't have a dad, as it happens. You know, my father died when I was three years old. Um, so so you know. Um, so the answer is it, it's all about about success is, is measured in a different way. I'm I'm getting my satisfaction from doing things like this because uh, yeah. it's great to be involved and it's great to think and great to talk and great that people want to listen. Um, I'm also getting it from watching my children. You know whether whether it's education and my kids are doing really well right now. I've got one doing A levels and one doing um, GCSEs, another at ba in Bath at university, and you know it, it, and getting messages from the school saying. You know, your kid got a, an achievement award this this today and five last week. You know, and that's what makes me happy today, and and that's my idea of success. Yeah, I love it because I think success is different from for everyone. Uh, financial success is great, but does it give you happiness? And I think happiness is the number one thing that you I think is success really, and uh, I love that. Look, I I really thank you so much for your time today. Just one last golden nugget that you can give everyone. And then uh, if you can f tell everyone how people can find you and find out more about you. Well, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook, but ideally LinkedIn. Um, and as I said, the website, milliondollaririshman.com. Um, I think, I think, I think, you know, everybody can learn from what I've learned. And I'm really glad to have the opportunity of being here today to talk about it. I mean, just, just two weeks ago um, was um, Mental Health Awareness Week. And I was on that thing with um, Causeway, um, the, the, the Ireland, Scotland Business Network. And it, I was on with, um, with um, Mike Stevenson and it really, oh, yeah. really drove home for me, you know, uh, listening to him and his story. And I started to think, Actually, you know, I've got a great story. You know, I've written it down in the book, but I hadn't really thought about getting it out to the wider public. So, so right now, I'm keen to be involved in this sort of conversation and motivational speaking and, and any other thing. And, and and it's all positive. I'm just yeah. it's great to be able to reflect and be positive. Thank you for your time, Jason. Thank you so much. Uh, you've listened to the Mindful Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Cooper. This will be available on iTunes, Spotify, and my YouTube channel. If you like it, and I'm sure you will, please write a comment, share it, share the love. But also, I want you to listen to what's being said today. And if you can take one thing out of it, I think uh, it'd be fantastic. I learn so much from every single podcast that I listen to, but also every single podcast that I present as well. So thank you so much, Chris. You're phenomenal. <laughs> Pleased to hear it. Thank you. Have a good day.